operating cash flow during the operating life, and uh, and and uh, and the whole repayment structure. Now. Um, No, that's different. Okay. Um, so during the construction, the cash flows are negative and have to be covered by shared capital from sponsors and, and bank loans. And then during operations, the cash flow become positive. And any residual, uh, after all the payments are made, then fall to the, to the equity holder. Now, I have to draw. I have to draw something. Oh, I won't show the boards. Um, is that a board? Is that a board? Here, right here. Yeah. Okay. What they're now doing, all of this is bond finance. So if this is 30 years, and we build it in three years, and uh, and then here we'll take the last five off. So it's five and three is eight. So we've got 22. No, I'm sorry. Three, and this is this is essentially year one. So this is year. This is zero. Three years of building. Um, so it's uh, it's 25 years. Okay. So they have to finance this whole thing with bonds. So what they've done, the government in in certainly in Canada is saying we don't want to carry all this debt. It just doesn't make sense. First of all, it's politically difficult for us to defend. Uh, us paying money in the private debt market. So what they do is at point of substantial completion, the government will pay down 50% of the debt. And then, um, and then, so it, it, it reduces the overall cost of, 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 the, um, of the project. So what they've done is they've issued bonds here and they've issued them in a ratio that at the point of it go, these are these are called short bonds, and they're seven years. So essentially, what the government can do is is retire the short bonds, and then they have the long bonds, which go out to they go out to here, and these are thirty-year bonds. And the way they structured it is you have to buy, to buy a long bond, you gotta buy so many short bonds. And they actually made it so that it gave a capital structure that they could retire some of the debt. Um, and what they do in the last, what they do here is they actually amortize it so that the bonds essentially get paid off here and then the excess goes into a cash reserve fund which if it's not spent, it goes back to the operator. So there's a real incentive for the operator not to defer maintenance. Because the last thing you want is the government taking this pot of money and fixing up the building. And, and so this combination of long and short bonds has, has been quite successful. Um, and and um, I'll just show you the concept. So this gives you the kind of unleveraged cash flow where you get interest on the senior loan, interest on any subordinated loans, senior loan repayment, subordinated loan repayment, debt service provisions, and then you've got your operation and maintenance provisions. And, and so you're doing the same thing in terms of your debt payment. So the first waterfall showed you the major bucket. This one's showing you just how, who, who, who takes, you know, anytime you do real estate, it's always who, Who's first, who's second, same thing. Who gets paid first? Well, the first is interest on your senior debt. So um, this is what happened here um, in a timeline. Um, here's Lehman Brothers. Here's the Bear Stearns collapse. And then here's Lehman Brothers, and the market goes nuts. Okay, so here's your spread. 
So, I mean, we were issuing bonds, um, uh, 30-year index corporate, 30-year uh, Canadian corporate. So, we were um, we were issuing bonds, you know, with very very little spread. And then this happened. The market just blew up. And uh, the hospital I'm doing the case study is this one. And right when this blew up was the one I told you about, the Niagara Healthcare. And up until this point, the banks had been basically financing it, and then they would issue a corporate debt. And then they walked away from the deal. And so they came up with this idea. It was like the old days where we had to find equity to, to recapitalize real estate. We discovered CMBS and REITs. So they had to find a way to recapitalize the industry. And so what they did is they went to a private placement bond market. And these are some of the closings that happened. Now, how they were able to close here is going back to what I said, and that is they said um, they said to the to the event, to the SPV, look at um, you know, given this uncertainty, um, we could go to the bank and, and we could they would tell us directly what it was. 3.8. The bond market would. So then, uh, the the government said, okay, we'll take a, a, a T bill, and then we'll we'll have a uh, we'll have this flexible uh, rate, this floating rate, based upon what the market. Because we can't ask you to give us this price. It just won't work with the fluctuation. And so this this is what essentially what happened. Is it took some of the risk off the it took some of the risk off the bidders, and and so then what happened is uh, they discovered that there was a real appetite for these bonds because the insurance companies had a dilemma in that they didn't know what to invest in. All these companies were backing out of the equities market. Uh, most of our insurance companies own enough; they don't want to buy more real estate because they got too much. And they're saying, hey, this is a pretty good deal. We can buy a 30-year bond at 3.89%. Perfect. And so they, the, the, they, were, they ate up the bond market. And it's, it's worked ever since. Um, here's the Humber River close that I referred to. And so look at this, under 3%. It's 3 point, so 2.89% they were getting on a 30-year fixed, that's pretty good. Um, so, I mean, one of the questions we ask is, why do you need tax-free bonds? You know, when you've got, when you've developed a bond market that's giving you that rate. Now, some of these people, the pension funds don't have to pay tax. The life insurance companies will, but that's, you know, their issue is, how do we match our liabilities against our income? And, and if they know they're going to get 3.89 or 2.89 percent for 30 years fixed, they say that takes a lot of pressure off us because otherwise we're getting like penny on. You know, we're not going to buy stocks. We're not. Where else do we put our money? So this is what's happened in in the in the bond market, and you can see from this point on, um, it went from about five and a half all the way down. And it's been steady since May of 2000, and pretty steady since about September of 2009, right through to, to this date, which is good news. I mean, that kind of steadiness gives the market some comfort that, that things are working. So the thing that you have to remember in PPP is if you don't have the money, you don't build it. And if you're going to commit to 30 years of operating it, you need a guarantee that your lender is there, that you've got 30-year money. And this is developing right now in Germany. And the UK is struggling to figure out how to do it. And because they're all saying, look at it. If you guys can do it, we should be able to do it. So there's an article that came out just a few days ago about the, uh, developing the German uh, private placement bond market. This this is the single biggest problem, I think that's not the single biggest, one of the big problems facing the PPP in the United States. 
is you've got um, the uh, munis, uh, whether and you've got the, uh, the TIFA, etc. And I've talked to my colleagues up there, and they said, number one, we can't figure it all out. And we're also realizing there's a lot of conflict. We know that Wall Street has deals with these municipalities. They're making money by picking them up. So it, the bond market is, is a very complex situation in, in the United States. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know anything about it, to be honest. I had a student trying to do a research paper, and he came back and said, I, I can't figure out what's going on. And, and so it might be a good piece of research. To, do, do you know much about it? I do. So we have a very simple bond market. It's a private placement um, bond. But look what's happened. So this is this was um, this was the bank lending, and they were they thought hey it's pretty good. I mean we can we can put this money out and then we can cover it with our own bond issues and we can get a one or two percent spread. But then when the crash hit, they said we're out of here. And the bond market was picking up a little bit. And then look what happened. Just took off. We're talking billions, okay? So we're saying today that market has issued over, it's about 4.3 billion in a very, very short period of time. So this was, this was the crash, November of 2008. If we hadn't solved the problem, then we wouldn't have PPPs. And, and the solution was simply the bid going in with what we call the Canada, you know, key bill and then a financial close. You call the banks and say, what spread do you give us over a key bill? There's a funny story on this. When they're closing one of these big hospitals, they had to transfer the cash over the wire. So, you know, it was 1.2 billion. The guy from the other side said, where is it? They said, we sent it to you. Said, what do you mean you sent it? It hasn't come. They said, for about 20 minutes, no one knew where the billion two was. <laughs> it was somewhere in the system. They discovered that you couldn't send more than 500 million. And somehow this whole thing had just gone somewhere. And they said, everyone was sweating. They finally broke it down into three tranches and sent them. Was, they didn't know it was a cap on how much you could transfer, but they said, man, were they sweating. Because this was, this was transaction value. And you've now sent it into the wire. It could be in some foreign country at this point. Uh, and and um, the cost of time, um, I'll just talk a little bit about why infrastructure is appealing uh, to the world investors. And that is that here is the kind of you know, index, market index of stock. Uh, I don't know which one it is, but it's an index, as good as any indexes are. But what here you see infrastructure. It's had this long rise since about 2006 against the equity market. Um, so during this period of economic turmoil, it's been one of the few assets that's performed according to expectation. Uh, and it's in, it's in better shape than before 2008, which is interesting thing. So it was one of the few things that weathered the storm of 2008 and actually responded in a very positive way and evolved to a new level because of that. And, and the result is that both listed and unlisted infrastructure are ending uh, the calendar year in relatively good health. This was calendar year 2012. It was a little bit old, but the point is that that um, they have they have shown the ability to survive. So infrastructures continue to deliver secure and stable cash flows, and can be seen from this graph as as uh, as as, um, as showing growth in dividend per share. So it, it it's a good story in in that sense. Uh, don't ask me what median net IRR, <laughs> but anyway, 
you know how analysts love to chart. So, uh, all I'm, I'm pointing out here is the infrastructure is in red, and um, here's real estate. And so, in fact, infrastructure is now seen as outperforming real estate, uh, and that's why it's gaining uh, a lot of support from private equity funds and from um, and, and from uh, the pension funds. Uh, it, it has done uh, it has done reasonably well uh, since uh, since the downturn, um, and, and so again, I'm just saying that how, no, no matter how you slice and dice it, um, the story seems to be that it is it has weathered the storm and it, it, it is performing. Again, we don't have any of these that have gone 30 years. Uh, this is global infrastructure fundraising from 2008, from the crash, to 2013. There is volatility, no question. But um, you can see the total capital raised uh, in, in 2008 was about $38 billion. And then the market crashed, and of course everyone reacted. And um, then of course, you know, oh, overreacted. <laughs> Let's Let's get back a bit, and um, it, so uh, these are these are total capital, and also the blue line is the number of funds, quote, the private equity funds. Um, so uh, this shows you the results of some of the economic turmoil today in the world. India's pulled back. Uh, it, you know, the governments don't have the money to step in. Um, and so you do see that infrastructure is going to be affected very much by, by world economic uh, uh, trends. So I mean, I'm not saying that you can see the line go up the whole way. Um, now, just to look at this closely, it would be interesting to see where the people are putting their money. And by far, it's energy. There are more funds in mark it targeted the energy and renewable investment than any other sector. So about s close to 60% of all funds are in energy, uh, about 40% renewables. And then um, you can see uh, transport is a third. So energy would be uh, basically power plants. Renewables would be wind farms, solar farms, that's what uh, and then you can see how it's, uh, it's diminishing. So if you're in this business, you better know a lot about energy, and you better know a lot about renewables. Because um, that's where the, that's where, and why? That's where the high demand is. 